Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance of the Shishra Prabhupada. Welcome to devotees of today's morning class. This morning we are coming from Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 18, Verse 16. And the chapter is entitled, Maharaj Prikshit Krist by a Brahmin Boy. We are in the discussion part where Sri Sutta Goswami is asked questions by the sages. But wanting to hear more of the glories of the Lord, we're very happy to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All grace to you and Shri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, all obeisances, glories to Prabhupada, all glories to the assembled Vaishnavas. And it's all yours, Maharaj. <laughs> Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Tavai Maha Bhagavata Pariksit Nena Pavarga Gyam Ababhadra Budihi Kanena Vayasaki Sambikena BJ Kagendra Dwajaparamulam. Let me get my glasses and I'll be right back. O oh, Sutta Goswami, please describe those topics of the Lord by which Maharaj Pariksit, whose intelligence was fixed on liberation, attained the lotus feet of the Lord, who is the shelter of Garuda, the king of birds. Those topics were vibrated by the son of Yas, Srila Sukadev. Purport. There is some controversy among the students on the path of liberation. Such transcendental students are known as impersonalists and devotees of the Lord. Right here, there's two kinds of what we say transcendentalists, those who are known as impersonalists and those who are devotees or Vaishnavas. Devotees of the Lord worship the transcendental form of the Lord Whereas the impersonalists meditate upon the glaring of fulgens or the bodily rays of the Lord, known as Brahma Jyoti. Here in this verse, it is said that Maharaj Parikshit attained the lotus feet of the Lord by instructions and knowledge delivered him by the son of Vyasadeva, Shiva Sukadeva Goswami. Sukadeva Goswami was also an impersonalist in the beginning as he himself has admitted in the Bhagavatam from Canto 2, verse one, chapter 1, verse 9. But later on, he was attracted by the transcendental pastime from the Lord and thus became a devotee. Such devotees with perfect knowledge are called Madhavagavats, or first-class devotees. Now, Prabhupada will explain there's three categories of devotees. There are three classes of devotees, namely the Prakrita, the Madhyamam, and the Mahabhagavat. The Prakrita, third class devotees, are temple worshippers without specific knowledge of the Lord and the Lord's devotees. The Madhyamam, the second class devotees, know, knows well the Lord, the Lord's devotees, the neophytes, and the non devotees also. But the Mahabhagavat, of the first class devotee sees everything in relationship with the Lord and the Lord present in everyone's relationship. The Mahabhagavata therefore does not make any distinctions, particularly between a devotee and a non devotee. Maharaj Priksha was such a Mahabhagavat devotee because he was initiated by a Mahabhagavat devotee, Sukadeva Goswami. He was also equally kind even to the personality of Godhead want to speak of others. So here, a little bit about the Mahabhagavata. 
He's not a preacher because he doesn't make distinctions between the non-devotees and devotees. He's on the highest platform and sees every, everyone as a devotee of the Lord. Um, it's not an artificial form of worship or an, imp an implicit, implication or an imposition on the mind that one adopts. It's actually a pure consciousness where everyone he sees both the non-devotees and devotees uh, as being uh, on an equal platform in the sense that he sees no need to preach him. Therefore, Mahabhagwats, in order to preach, they come down to the second class platform where they make the distinctions between devotees, non-devotees, the envious, and uh, they also have a relationship with the Lord. So four categories or four ca characteristics of the second class devotee is he gives his love to the Lord, makes friends with the devotees, preaches to the non-devotees, and avoids the atheistic envious. So that is the platform. That's why when we chant, the pranam prayers, we say Jayom Vishnupad Paramahansa Pariva Jakacharja. So Paramahansa is Mahabhagavad. Pariva Jakacharya is the traveling preacher who makes a distinction of the second class platform. So in that glorification of the pure souls, many of them are Mahabhagavats, but in, the, in, in order to preach, they leave that stage of consciousness to come down and to show compassion to the fallen conditioned souls they preach. Srila Prabhupada was a Mahabhagwa, and he indicated that at the very end of his life, when he was apologizing for everyone for making so many offenses. Of course, no one really accepted what he said, but that he was exhibiting his Mahabhagavat mood at the very last delay in their life, which means that he was making distinctions between devotees and non devotees, but that's necessary in order to preach. Okay, continue. So there are many instances in the transcendental history of the world of an impersonalist who has become. A devotee, we have the example of the four Kumaras. But a devotee has never become an impersonalist. This very fact proves that on the transcendental steps, the steps occupied by the devotee is higher than the step occupied by the impersonalist. The absolute truth is realized in three features, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. And each of those steps are higher. And so the impersonalists are on the Brahman platform. And as it says, they worship the glaring foes of the Lord, or they meditate upon the glaring foes of the Lord. They have no understanding or conception of the personality of Godhead. But if they come in contact, with something that is of the transcendental nature of the, the Lord, the personality of Godhead, just like the four Kumaras, simply by smelling the Tulsi leaves and sandalwood pulp offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, they became personalists. Um, the impersonalists, of course, think that the forms of the Lord are simply imagination created for the sake of worship because you have to have some image to worship. So these, these different forms of the Lord, they say are simply creations for the sake of worship. And once you become perfect and you worship, then you go to the understanding that beyond the person, the form, there is formless, which includes everything. They have their philosophy. But it says here that actually it is a lower stage because the impersonal aspect of the Lord is contained within the personality also. 
just like within the sun, there is the sunshine. The sunshine is the energy of the sun. It's the sun itself, but it's not the source of itself. The source is the sun. From the same way, personality is a source of impersonality, and both are aspects of the absolute truth. Well, one is the source and one is the energy. So the impersonalists, they worship the Lord spiritual energy without worshiping the Lord directly. And it says here that this stage of personalism is the highest or the perfection of worship. And it goes on to say, it is also stated in the Bhagavad Gita 12.5 that personalists stuck Persons stuck on the impersonal stage undergo much suffering than achievement of reality. If you read that verse, Klesha Dikta Taras Tesha Navyakta Vyakta Tesha Shav, that they have to undergo so much difficulty in their worship. And if their worship is slightly impaired by a mistake in the offering of the worship, then the whole worship is. Uh, a failure. You may start all over again, which is different when you worship the personality of Kaiho. Therefore, as he says, continues, knowledge imparted by Sukadev Goswami unto Maharaj Briksha helped him attain the service of the Lord. In this stage of perfection is called Apavarga, or the perfect stage of liberation. In other words, devotional service, to render loving devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the perfection of all spiritual attainment. Simple knowledge of liberation is material knowledge. Actual freedom from material bondage is called liberation. Just because if you get out of jail, and then you might say you're free from the bondage of jail, but that doesn't mean you have any meaning in your life unless you take up a positive activity. So just being freed from material bondage doesn't give you an under. They get, they get sat, they get realization. They have some chit, not, chit is not complete on that stage. Unless they come to the platform of worshiping the Lord as a super soul within the heart. And therefore, until they come to the platform of rendering loving devotional service to the transcendental form of the Lord, who is Krishna himself or any of his manifestations, then they haven't, then they haven't attained perfection in spiritual life. And that stage they attain is also a very uh, precarious stage, one can fall from that stage. But one cannot fall from rendering devotional service to the Lord in transcendence, as long as one stays in the activity of service. So attainment of transcendental service is the perfect stage of liberation. The Prabhupada is using that word liberation. That means ultimately, complete freedom from all material bondage and the activities of the, the, the soul in relationship to the Supreme Soul, Krishna. Such a stage is attained by knowledge and renunciation as we explained in 1 to 12 and perfect knowledge as delivered by Srila Sukadeva Goswami results in the attainment of the transcendental service of the Lord. So this stage of perfect knowledge is knowledge of my position, knowledge of the Lord's position, and knowledge of the activities that connect me with the, the Lord. So that those three categories of uh, two categories actually are called sambandha and the activity is called abhideya and the perfection of the activity or the goal of the activity is prayojana so one has to understand 
through knowledge and renunciation, what is my relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead? In our prayer that we sing every day, Chakshudan Diloye Janmi Janmi, I'll probably say, Dibya Gyan Ride Prakasita. We glorify the spiritual master. And what is he doing? He's giving Dib Gyan. That Dibya means transcendental and Gyan means knowledge. That knowledge, which is the identity of the soul and its relationship with the Supreme Soul. So in that knowledge, the Supreme, the, the Guru teaches you are Krishna, servant eternally. That is your actual position. Any material position, whatever we may engage in, such as the occupations we perform, the roles we play in relationship to family, society, and country, and the identity that we have based on the body is all ephemeral and, and elusive to our real identity. All of these things that we mentioned are transient and come and go like the waves of an ocean. When they hit the shore, then the, the wave is gone. Another wave comes and comes and so in this material world, we're coming in contact with various types of identities and other living beings. And we make friends, we make relationships, we make plans, we build our life around these things. But these are all based on the body. And knowing we are not the body means knowing that I am actually something else. And that something else is that we are pure spirit. So as God is pure, the soul is also pure. But like water, water comes in contact with various types of contamination. And it becomes muddy, becomes opaque, murky. We can't see it. Sometimes it becomes polluted and contaminated. You can't even use it. But water never loses its purity. It's just covered by all of these contaminations. You put it through the filtering process, it goes back to its natural state. I'll give you a material example of that. Um, in our Govardhan Echo Village farm, we have a, a recycled plant for uh, waste, waste recycled plant. So as people uh, deposit waste, it goes through a various process and it goes through a filtering process. And gradually all of the waste material is separated. And when, you, when it goes through a series of purifications, it comes back to natural, clear, pure water. So although it, in that state of contamination, it cannot be used as water, but still it retains its nature. But in the same way, in this material world, due to our association with matter, we connect with so many of these identities. And these identities give us a certain consciousness, which we think is in relationship to our existence, but actually they are simply based on the body. And you might also say the needs of the body. So the soul is by nature pure and Krishna is also pure. So some people say, well, in order for you to come to the stage of worshiping Krishna and loving devotion, you have to go through the lower stages of spiritual attainment. In other words, you have to perform karma yoga, then you have to perform jnana yoga, then you have to perform raja yoga. And of course, the astanga yoga system consists of many of these yogas in one eightfold process. And then when you perfect all of these, then you can move to the platform of bhakti. But that is also correct because Krishna gives 
the whole process in the Bhagavad Gita, where he explains karma yoga, jnana yoga, astanga yoga, and the various other yogas that are smaller yogas, which are supportive of these other yogas. But then he says, yoginam apisarve sam magatendranatmanaham bhajate sradavam bhajate yo mam te me mukta to mataha. He says, but who, he who worshiped me is in devotion. Uh, and uh, he who abides by me and worships in me in devotion is considered to be the, a yogi and is the highest of all yogis. He is the bhakti yogi. So we have, do we have to go through the different lower stages? Not necessarily. We can take right to the bhakti process. But if we have a working knowledge of these other yogas and how they work, and what are the benefits that they also give, then we can understand the difference between what is bhakti, karma, and ultimately, uh, or, or jnana, bhakti, and karma yoga. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, knowledge and renunciation is a foothold, and it's really connected with jnana yoga. So you see, when we begin our devotional service, we cultivate knowledge. And we are asked to follow a series of austerities, which causes us to give up or renounce certain material desires and material activities. But these are just to get a foothold in bhakti, so we can work in bhakti without being diverted by these other desires. And once that foothold is established, once one becomes fixed in worshiping the Supreme Lord in devotion, then jnana and karma, or knowledge and renunciation, automatically come by way of the process of bhakti, because they're also included in the bhakti process. So, if, um, so bhakti is ultimately the highest principle. But we see, although people, although we have a society, there are many persons in our society who are still not on the bhakti platform. They have some desire for name, fame, position, power, good health, liberation, peaceful life, you name it many of the qualities of the mode of goodness, but they are not transcendental. So unless we actually cultivate this mood of loving devotional service with, it, with the desire to attain complete shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord, then we haven't actually understood or haven't, haven't actually entered into the process of bhakti. Bhakti is there. Bhakti is the internal energy of the Lord. It's personified by Srimati Radharani, who is called Bhakti Devi. She's the complete manifestation of pure bhakti. And she, she demonstrates that pure bhakti by unalloyed service to Krishna. Her only, her only desire is to please Krishna. Whatever she does is for pleasing Krishna. So that is bhakti to try to please Krishna. And Krishna is not very difficult to please, but what is difficult is that to cultivate that desire to please Krishna. Because in trying to please Krishna, we also try to please ourselves. And then when our bhakti becomes mixed with some desire, the food of gain, and that's uh, somewhat in the mode of karma yoga. Or even jnana yoga also. So Rupa Goswami gives the formula in the, in the Bhakti Rasamrita to Sindar in the introduction. He says, Ayavila um, Sita Sunya, Jnana Kama and Arvritam, Anukulena Krishna Silanam, Bhakti Uttama. And that Bhakti has to be free from personal desire for gain through activity, our philosophical speculation on the absolute truth. It has to be 
execute it with, with a desire to please Krishna. Has to be directed towards Krishna with a desire to please Krishna. That is, that is pure devotional service. That has pure consciousness, which leads to pure devotional service. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the process. And it's very easy. If we chant the holy names of the Lord, purify our consciousness through the process of chanting, we awaken that desire to simply please Krishna and not become concerned about what are we getting or what are we not getting. Uh, in other words, the service becomes the focus and whatever Krishna provides for me is his mercy and we can accept it. We accept everything as simply the mercy of the Lord. We're not making plans to become happy simply by engaging in devotional service. Devotional service is on the transcendental platform, so for it, it includes automatically ananda, or transcendental happiness. The devotees not even worried, or aren't even concerned about that. So they want to satisfy the Lord. Um, and to satisfy the Lord means to try to satisfy the Lord. And that's what it means, actually. Um, it's difficult to understand exactly how to execute bhakti in a perfect way. But if we have the desire that my dear Lord, please accept the service that I'm trying to offer to your devotees, to your mission, to you, um, like that. If we have that desire, then even if the service is not rendered perfectly, the desire is pure. And that pure desire is accepted by the Lord and the devotee becomes happy and become devotee becomes free from material suffering and they actually get situated nicely in their position. Then service becomes natural. It's no longer done simply uh, as an activity. It becomes a way of life. And then everything that devotee does is in that mood. So that takes practice and purification of the heart. It all, the purification of the heart comes by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, which leads to pure consciousness, which leads to pure activities. And these pure activities will satisfy the Lord in devotion like that. The impersonalists, they, they want to touch their nose by putting their hand around the back of their head to get to their nose, but the devotees go right directly to the source. So this uh, this liberation or impersonalist activity of meditating on the effulgence of the Lord is simply troublesome, as it's explained in the Bhagavad Gita. Simply troublesome. Better to go the direct process. But cultivation of some transcendental knowledge, which allows us to stay fixed in devotional service, is the foundation by which we can continue in our devotional service. What is that transcendental knowledge? I am Krishna's servant. I have no I other identity. That is me. <laughs> and my activity is to serve the Lord, to serve the Lord by serving the Lord's devotees. It sounds very easy, and it actually is easy, but because of our attachments to this material world, we struggle to come to that stage. But therefore, the purification of the heart through the chanting of the holy name both awakens that desire, and at the same time, it, uh, it, it purifies us from all of these other desires. Okay. Thank you so much, Marsh. for such a wonderful class. Really am amazing points. I'm going to stop sharing and um, ask devotees for questions. I just got the first question and I'm going to read it out, Maharaj. Uh, it's, hi, it's from Ilyania. Hi, Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisance. So, God, you should prop and should Guru Dev. The devotee Mahabhagavat makes no distinction between devotee and non-devotee such as Marj Pariksha. But I, who am not Mahabhagavat, how should I behave? 
if an advanced devotee commits criminal acts, how should I see him? To what extent should I forgive? I have to recognize all the service he has done up to that point, right? How can my conscious not be disturbed and how can I overcome dual, du dualism? There are a lot of questions there, Marge. Hmm. Well, first of all, you have to be, make sure you're seeing things in the right way. Sometimes it's difficult to understand one who is more advanced than us. We may see some discretion. Tejas Samraja Sire means that sometimes a great soul will do something that is outside of the category of devotional service, but it's not sinful. It depends. This requires some intelligence. Generally, better not to find fault or to condemn or criticize. But if you feel uh, disturbed by that, better to either inquire from other senior devotees, what is the situation? Someone who's on the same level of that person that you're viewing to get a, a better understanding. And uh, definitely try to avoid that association so you don't become more disturbed and become victimized by it. The best thing is to get knowledge from others. I'm seeing this person, they're acting like this. What is the actual situation? Hope that helped, Ilyana. She's typing. Okay, go ahead. Hare Krishna. My humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Gurudeva and all Vaishnava. Um, I understand a little, but uh, I registration this lesson and uh, I hearing in the second moment the this um, this point. Well, if you feel disturbed, best to speak to another senior devotee and try to understand from their perspective what is happening with this other devotee. Oh, yes. Rather to make a judgment or to find fault. You may be wrong. You may be seeing things differently, or you don't know, you can't see the whole picture anyway. Excuse me, but I... Yeah, better to ask someone who knows. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gurudeva. Yeah, I was wondering where you were today. I was thinking, where is Elena? I'm uh, uh, now. I'm uh, now. Now I'm in Milan, but uh, a few days I go in the temple to live. I live. I go in uh, in Genova Temple. Okay. I write you a uh, uh, email this morning. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank Hare. you for the question. Very nice question. Uh, I'll also like to request devotees if, you, if you're able to please turn on your videos where you can so that um, we can see each other and have each other's association. Yes, Namrata, please go ahead. Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. How how to distinguish um okay very firstly first question should be should we distinguish between devotees and non-devotees and um uh, and second related question is uh, if yes then how do we do that in a way that we that as a devotee we don't get a pride of that thing we don't get what pride pride well, 
Just by distinguishing, you can get bright. Yeah, I have seen, uh, Guru Maharaj, that uh, sometimes uh, when devotees and non-devotees are there, um, the non-devotees, they, they have this uh, feeling that, oh, they think themselves as devotees and they categorize it uh, uh, us in one category. And it, as if um, we, are dis, uh, we are just pushing them away, oh, you are a non-devotee, I'm a devotee, something like that. So. Um, uh, I don't think that feeling should come up when we are preaching or when we are um, uh, interacting with them. Well, there's in the Bhagavatam it explains there's three three categories: relationships with devotees who are senior to you, relationships with others who are equal to you. And relationships with those who are in a lesser platform. So you might also include the non devotees being on the lesser platform. So the last one is called Jiva Doya. Doya means mercy. So we, we make a distinction between devotees and non devotees for the sake of preaching. But preaching means to benefit the non-devotees. So our, our distinction, and of course, if someone is a devotee, but they're acting like a non-devotee, then usually we may also uh, see that and uh, distance ourselves from that in order not to be affected by that. But in no case do we find, do we condemn or criticize. That's that platform is a neophyte platform who, because of their very little advancement in spiritual life, they feel threatened by others. Uh, a devotee fixed in Krishna consciousness doesn't feel threatened by others because they know where the who they are and they know how to they, how they're supposed to act. But one on the neophyte platform will find be criticized or even uh, will criticize or even find reasons to condemn such persons. All those rotten karmis, we say, people say. But yes, their activities are rotten. <laughs> no question about that. But there's still part and parcel of Krishna and spirit souls are just covered. And so you're, you're criticizing the shadow, not the person, actually. So distinction has to be made in order to avoid becoming trapped by wrong association. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. There was this uh, very um, known speaker uh, in the local area where I live. So he was telling that um, whenever he preaches, at least now, he, he was talking about his evolution in uh, preaching. So he said that uh, then before, uh, before uh, previously, he used to speak uh, as it is, but uh, sometimes according to the audience, he has to be very careful with the words, especially when when it is India, because um, uh, they get offended. Oh, you, you are telling me a karmi? Oh, you are telling me like this, like this? So, uh, yes, as you are telling that they are rotten, but we can't tell them that they are rotten. We have to tell them they're off without without letting them know you're telling them they're off. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Rather than telling them or explaining to them 
what not to do, better to approach it from the positive, encourage them in the proper activities, the proper consciousness. When you're dealing with children, you tell them, don't do this, do this. When you're dealing with adults, you want to move them forward, you encourage them in the positive. Rather than just telling them what not to do, because the adults will move, will find more, will become more offended that way. Because they're more intelligent than children, better to encourage them in the right way rather than in the wrong way. But when, when we're preaching to devotees, then we say everything clear. When we're speaking to the non-devotees, we have to know the audience. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So when we don't tell them whatever it is right away, I mean, when we tell them the things, we cannot tell them. To adults, we cannot tell things right away. But with children, we can do that. So uh, is it this human psychology we are ta uh, tackling it or uh, we have to be careful at their self-ego, uh, sorry, false ego? Prabhupada, you listen to one lecture by Prabhupada. He was talking about long, we're keeping long hair again after, you know, he was preaching, you know, about the importance of shaving head. He said, I am an old man and you are a young man. And I, I, I cannot tell you what to do, but, you know, our movement is based on, on the, being clean shaven like that, he would say. But then he would also, he also said in that same lecture, if you tell grown up people what not to do, they, they can, he said, you can break a person, they can go away. They can become defensive or offended. So you have to somewhat couch your word. Preaching is an art. It's not just speaking certain words. You, you have to learn the art of preaching. And that, that means you hear from others and learn how to present the arguments according to the audience. In some places, the best way to preach is just do kirtan. Because people can't understand or accept philosophy. But by doing kirtan, they become purified. And then eventually, they'll come to the plat platform of becoming more open and receptive to transcendental knowledge. That's, Prabhupada used that tactic a lot. It's not a tactic, it's actually the way of purification. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Let's move along here. <laughs> Thank you, Marsh. Very deep questions very nice and i'm sure some of us have experienced that situation so thank you for uh, asking that question namrata there's a question here Marj, by nashringa leela and uh she's asking Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances all the sure proud but sometimes we find ourselves in situations when devotees trying to preach in a harsh way thinking they are straightforward sometimes it happens that congregation gets angry can you comment on that how to distinguish between straightforwardness and harshness? It's a matter of mm, such in priyam, such in brilliam. Speak truthfully, but speak it in a pleasant way. Harshness is a quality of the of the non-devotees or the 
Harshness is the quality of the demons. The bodies are not harsh. Harsh, the English word, not harsh, the uh, Hindi word. Harsh in Hindi or in Sanskrit means happiness. But harsh in, in the English means just very insensitive to others. Thank you, Marge. I hope that helped, Nushinga Leela. She'll yeah. put a post, I'm sure. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions from devotees that you would like to ask? Oh, wait, something else came up. Let me see. Yes, she said yes. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay. Marge, um, any questions from devotees before I open up for... Uh... Okay, Marge, I have a question, and that is... Um, when you were speaking about bhakti and you were saying that um, some people may think that they are on the level of bhakti, but they are not because they have all these attachments and, you know, and um, desires and so on and so forth. But come across a situation, Marge, where sometimes even though one is a devotee initiated and they are on the path of bhakti, they still feel that they are very high, but their mood doesn't come across that way. How do we help someone like that, Marge? They feel they're very what? They feel that they are definitely at the high level of bhakti, but we but it's also obvious that they are not there because of their attachments, you know, their, their mode of service, and so on and so forth. So how can we help someone to really see if they would like to see and to help them grow because i come across you know situations where they really think no i'm i'm elevated you cannot tell me anything well gyan is not the uh, is not the position of superiority it's devotion gyan is, 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 a, is a characteristic of devotion that is not just because you know the philosophy or have memorized the philosophy that doesn't mean you're advanced. Advancement, Srila Prabhupada has given us, he said, those who are on the high, highest platform of bhakti are fully engaged in devotional service 24 hours a day with the desire to offer loving devotional service to Krishna. They're attached to Krishna and they're attached to serving Krishna. That's, that's, that's perfection. Not like, well, I, I can remember, I memorized all of the different verses in the Bhagavatam and therefore I'm advanced. Yeah. Parrots can memorize things too. Yes, Marge, that's so true. <laughs> they definitely can. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Any questions from devotees? Any thoughts that's coming to your mind? This is a very deep class on the three levels of devotees and how we can all grow in uh, Krishna consciousness through devotional service. So please do ask your question. Marge, another question I had, I'm looking at, does anyone put their hands up yet? Okay. Marge, when you were speaking about, um, I'm trying to open up others. Marge, are Mahabhagavats generally not preachers? Generally, just I'm just wondering. Uh, well, Prabhupada has made that as an absolute statement. He says the Mahavad Bhagavad doesn't preach because they make no distinction. In order to preach, you have to distinguish between devotee and non devotee. Mm. They don't. Mm. Mm. They see everyone more advanced than they are. And Marge, for a for a Mahabhagavad, um, you know, not because they see everything related to Krishna, is it easier for them to switch to the second level to preach, or they just 
stay on that level and it's a challenge no they come down many of our preachers are maha mahabhaga what's in order yes. to preach as i explained that 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 prem dwani mm -hmm. jai om vishnu pad mahansa pariva jakacharya Paramahansa is Mahabhagavan, Praveer Jakacharya is the stage lower, is the traveling preacher. Mm -hmm. So they come down. Srila Prabhupada came down to preach. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati came down to a lower platform in order to preach. In other words, they, I, how they do it, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not on that platform. So it's done simply by taking up the, the the instructions of the spiritual master to spread Krishna consciousness. Yeah, Prabhupada, you know, he talks about himself. He said, I was so happy sitting in Vrindavan. Everything was there. Jamuna was there. Overdon was there. Everything was there. I had my little room. I was so happy. Yeah. And but then my the instruction was go to the West and preach. <laughs> so following the orders of the spiritual master, we give up that that stage of complete purification. Uh, they don't become impure, but they just make that distinction. That's all. The four qualities of the second class person becomes adopted by the first class person when he comes down to the second class. Marge, as you were speaking about Prabhupada, you know, how he was saying that he had everything in Vrindavan. And he came to a West, you know, and I was just, I mean, and I sometimes get that these thoughts, but it's, it must have, must have been a really tough time for Prabhupada to make that difficult choice. Well, the instructions of the spiritual master supersede, yeah. and he, that, he kept that within his heart. And he was given that instruction directly. <laughs> Like I, I just came back from Vrindavan today. I was there for four or five days. And I was thinking, oh my God, I don't want to leave here. <laughs> it's so nice. <laughs> just to be in Vrindavan. Whether you're preaching or not, if you're in Vrindavan, of course, you should be doing some service because you have to serve the Dom. But that's just natural. When you're there, you want to serve. But the, the mood of Vrindavan is Radharani is so merciful. And it's all, it's permeated throughout the air. At the air. It's so thick. Uh, it's, when you're in Vrindavan, if you have material desires and you try to fulfill it, then you can't actually experience Vrindavan. But if you come to Vrindavan simply to serve and to associate with the Dham, by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, it's uh, it's bliss. <laughs> but higher than that, he has to take up the position of preaching. That's higher because that's why the Lord came. He came to uplift the conditioned souls. And so anyone who takes up the mission of the Lord has also become very dear to the Lord. And then, although they may be anywhere in the world, they live in Vrindavan because the Vrindavan mood is the mood of selfless service. Mm. Thank you, Marge. Thank you. Any questions from devotees? Please, uh, yeah, uh, yes, go ahead, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances for Gosh Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, could you just say a few words about the significance of Govardhan Puja today?
Namaste, Giriraj Jaya, Govardhan Dari, Govardhan Dari Namine, Chesa Klesha Asaya, Parvananda Darine. That's a, that's the Maha Mantra or the Pradhan Mantra for Giridaj. Um, translation. Let me go get it. I wrote down the translation here. Be right back. I'll be right back. I'll give you the translation for that. Let me see. Yeah. One minute here. Nami Namaste Giriraj Jaya Si Govardhana Namine Ashesha Klesha Nasaya Paramananda Daine. I offer my respectful obeisance to the King of all hills, Govardhan Hill, the source of enjoyment for the senses, lands, and cows. He is the servant of Krishna and is Krishna himself. He puts an end to unlimited suffering, bestows the supreme bliss. Namo Vrindavanakya Tubya Goloka Maline Purna Brahmata Patraya Namo Govardhanaya Cha Obeisances to you who are the crown of Goloka who sits on the lap of Vrindavan. Obeisances to Govardhan, the parasol of the Supreme Personality of God. Hatyam Adir Abala Haridasavaryo Yavama Krishna Charanam Sparsrasa Namodaha Namam Tanoti Saha Gogano Yos Tayo Yat Paniya Surya Vasa Kandaram Kandamurai Of all the devotees, this Govardhan hill is the best. Oh, my friends, this hill supplies Krishna and Balaram along with their calves, cows, and cowherd friends with all kinds of necessities, water for drinking, very soft grass, caves, flowers, fruits, vegetables. In this way, the hill offers respects to the Lord. Being touched by the lotus feet of Krishna and Balaram, Govardhan Hill appears very jubilant. Nirupadi karune na sri sachinanda na sachinanda na kapi sto pi tat prayar pito smi iti kalo mama yogya yogya yatam mam agra agranam ni janikatya nivasam dehi govardhan atvam O govardhan, although I am a cheater and a criminal. Unlimited merciful Lord Sachinandana, who is very dear to you, has given me to you. Please do not consider whether I am acceptable or not, but simply grant me residence near you. This is spoken by Raghunath Das Goswami from the Stava Valley. O devotees, worship the king of mountains. Govardhan Hill was decorated by a sapphire gem, Krishna, and many golden necklaces, the gopis. And these are some mantras and glorification of Govardhan. Thank you, Maharaj. They're very, very beautiful, very poetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Read the pastime. Observe yourself into... We can enter into these pastimes. It's not like they're so 
far away from us. If we just absorb ourselves in hearing them, reading of them, and th thinking about them, gradually we enter into them. And we can also taste the sweetness of what is, what is this pastime exuding? Simply, simply by becoming absorbed in hearing about these pastimes. Not like it's another world and here we are. No, we can become part of that world. That's our goal, actually. Become part of that world. <laughs> the world of reality. <laughs> thank you, Marge. I hope that helps. It was very sweet. Thank you. Actually, thank you for asking about that mantra. It was very sweet. Thank you. Any questions from devotees that you would like to ask? Um, anything that you would like to clear up? Going down the list just to make sure that I don't miss anybody. And, uh, oh, yeah, okay. If there isn't, Marsh, would you like to end with one round of chanting? Yeah. <laughs> 